After Pup Pup's success, the team at Humongous Entertainment naturally wanted to develop another series, which they did with Fatty Bear in 1993. However, while it did do okay sales wise, it wasn't as popular as Pup Pup, and the company would have had to pay royalties if they wanted to continue making more games with the character. So, with the Barrett not taking off as well as the car did, what would be their second adventure series? Well, instead of looking in a child's toy box, they'd have to take a dive under the sea to find their next junior adventure series, Freddy Fish. The series revolves around Freddy, a young goldfish and her best friend Luther, as they solve various mysteries across the ocean, from a haunted schoolhouse and the theft of a priceless conch shell, to a missing kelp sea treasure and locating a sea monster. But it isn't always easy for them as they encounter various obstacles and foes while searching for clues and gathering up the necessary items needed to crack each case. Basically, imagine if Nancy Drew or Carmen Sandiego were a six-year-old kid detective that just so happened to be a goldfish. The idea for it came when one crew member, Brad Carlton, drew up a comic strip called Ted's Eyeballs, featuring two fish called Ed and Fred. Yes, you heard that correctly, Freddy was originally a boy fish. Together with Ron Gilbert and a scriptwriter, they proceeded to flesh out the story of the first Fred Fish game but it wouldn't fully take shape until one other person came on board. Enter game designer Tammy Borowick. When she joined the project, she made one suggestion that would change the course of the game, and that was to change Fred from a boy to a girl, and change his name, as she wanted to upend the very persistent feeling in the game industry that girls would play boy characters, but boys would not play girl characters. But it had one major hurdle. When she asked the scriptwriter to make the changes, the writer also added in new dialogue for Freddy like, Oh, that's too hard to do, whenever she was confronted with a difficult puzzle. Unfortunately and sadly, this was the norm for games at the time, that a girl character would be depicted as being feeble and weak. But Borowip pushed back on adding those lines, feeling that they undercut her character. So they were all removed, and the final game is all the better because of it. When the game first began production, it was originally being developed for the MS-DOS, much like Fatty Bear and the first two Putt-Putt games, as seen in these images from a rarely seen proto-demo, and it was about halfway through production. But then, one event occurred that would forever change not just this game's direction, but the whole future of Humongous Entertainment. In 1994, Ron Gilbert was attending a gaming conference, where he saw an executive from another kids game company presenting their new game and showing that it was being made using hand-drawn art and animation on paper as opposed to pixels. It was there that it dawned on Gilbert that, with this new development, it suddenly made what they were doing look old-fashioned and dated, so he decided that would be the direction their games were going from then on. But there was just one catch. No one in the company's crew was trained to do traditional hand-drawn animation, but that didn't stop them from trying as they eagerly left at the opportunity. It also came at a fortunate time, too, as they were gearing up to move up from the MS-DOS to Windows 95. From there, the first thing the team did was scrap all the original art and start it all over again, but kept the initial story and design intact. From there, they made new fully hand-painted backgrounds that were much bigger in detail that were scanned in, cleaned up, and rendered in a different aspect ratio. Before then, depending on which series it was, the backgrounds were done in either markers or were painted on screen. Next, they brought on board an animator to help the team get a better idea of how traditional cartoons were done, as well as teaching them about ink and painters so the animators could concentrate on what they did best. They also began hiring clip point artists since, up to this point, the animators used to do it all themselves. As a result, their project teams went from being just 10 on Papa Goes to the Moon to around 60 with Freddy Fitch. On a side note, they only had one person leading the whole project, and that was Tammy Borowick, so you can imagine it was a tough task. And with all of that, the first Freddy Fish game was born. And if you're curious if Putt Putt Saves the Zoo started out the same way, no, 
it was made for Windows right from the start. Now, I've already broken down how the games get made in the pop-up video, so what I said there applies here and for the others. Anyways, on with the show. In the first game, the case of the missing kelp seeds, Grandma Grouper's kelp seed treasure has been stolen, and if it's not recovered soon, the entire ocean's food supply will be gone and all the fish will die. Yep, they really say that at the very start. We need to find Grandma Grouper's treasure chest because that's where the kelp seeds are. If we don't find them soon, all the fish are going to die. So now, it's up to Freddy and her best friend Luther to find and follow the clues left in bottles and get the location of the kelp seed treasure before it's too late. As the first game in the series, it's a pretty simple mystery adventure, but it's plenty of fun, has some good and humorous moments, is charming, and can be a little suspenseful at points. The team also did a good job at introducing players to the world, its characters, and setting up the mystery and where everything is laid out. Some of the puzzles are cleverly put together and require a bit of problem solving. The characters are charming, fun, and colorful though a couple might come off grating to some, and the antagonists make for some pretty humorous villains. Uh, gee, boss, the kelp treasure ain't here! <laughs> the gameplay is fairly simple and straightforward, as you just go around the area, finding the clues and collecting the necessary items needed to help further progress through the game. One nice touch added was giving the players the option to rescue some of the characters and having them appear at the end if this is done. The feeding animals bit is a fun little minigame that, though it does nothing in solving the mystery, works at bringing relief to some players. The backgrounds are very lavishly detailed and work well at invoking that naturalistic ocean feel, as well as getting creative with some of the locations and does a good job at making the world look and feel massive. As for the character designs and animation, while they are a bit rough around the edges, it's still pretty smooth, and having some background bubbles popping up occasionally is a nice detail. It also has a slightly darker atmosphere compared to the later games, since it does take place around late afternoon, early evening, and it does carry the burden of the entire fish population's fate resting in the character's fins, though obviously, no one dies in the game. The actual mystery itself is decently set up, and having the bottles being in different locations adds to its replayability, as well as how one goes about retrieving them using the items they collect along the way. But it could have been built up and interconnected better. Which leads us to some of the game's flaws. For starters, since this was the very first humongous game to be done completely in hand drawn, there are many times where the characters will go off model even more so than in puff Save Saved the Zoo. But this is forgivable, as the team was just getting used to animating this way. Next, there are the way the items are laid out. Now, as I said before, they are necessary for advancing to the next stages. The issue is, some of them aren't needed on a specific path, and by having them all available at once, many of them wound up serving no purpose, and the player will end up with items they didn't really need to get by the end like the amount of purple sea urchins or the glowing shell. Not to mention, placing arrows on every screen, though helpful for younger players to not get lost, does give the game that holding hand feel. Lastly, there's how the whole conflict gets resolved. Now, it's not terrible in the slightest, and it does have a decent moral, but it gets resolved a bit too easily. I mean, all Freddy does is suggest to the sharks that they all share the kelp seeds while also stating that the kelp seeds are for everyone and they agree to go with it boom the conflict's over and they bring the kelp seeds back to grandma grouper it feels like there should have been a bit more added to make it feel complete with that said however those flaws don't take away the game's level of fun and enjoyment while this is the first humongous game to have interchangeable paths it should be noted that the Scum Engine was always built to support multiple puzzle paths, ever since it was first made for Maniac Mansion. As I said in the pup up video, there are a few aspects in the early ones that do get randomized. What street you start on, which apartment floors you go to, baby beep shape and color, etc, etc. Heck, 
Even Fatty Bear had this by changing up some of the item's locations. Freddy Fist just happened to be their first series to implement it for the game pads. Plus, it makes perfect sense for a mystery game series like this, since giving it just one path with little random bits changed up like Pop Hunt and Fatty Bear did would have made the game more predictable and less replayable. Now, of course, I can't go about talking about this game without bringing up one of its most well-known hidden easter eggs. What you thinking about, Freddy? Oh, nothing, Luther. Supposedly, animator Tom Bird did it as a way to just blow off some steam one day. Honestly, it's a thankful thing it wasn't in the final game because they would have had floods of angry letters from parents all about it. But that's not the only notable aspect not in it. There are a couple of clip points that are left out as well. One involved a hanging fish skeleton in Mr. Starfish's room, and this seemed to have been a last minute change as not only can it be seen in a couple of pre-release screenshots, but you can also spot an out of place cutout in the rocks. The others are on the sunken ship's deck, where there are two animations of the sword's handle coming to life. It's not known why these two were removed. Also, there are some unused music cues, consisting of one that's nearly identical to another piece, but has Tiki as chanting in it, which didn't make it due to either not finding the right place for it, or because it plays into some Islander stereotypes. Two cues intended for the king's castle that don't play due to how the game engine handles the music. A second cue for the sunken ship, which may or may not have been done as a possible fallback, but can't be accessed since the player is locked into that area until the end. A variant of one background cue, but with vocals. Freddy, we need your help, please. We need to find the missing help, please. Freddy, we need your help. We need to find the missing help. And the full version of the shark's theme. When the game first came swinging to PCs on October 28, 1994, it was... good. Critics felt the game was a little too easy, its actual mystery being a little weak, and felt it didn't take full advantage of its underwater setting, but did give it good praise for its animation, gameplay, puzzles, and the music. As for the game sales, it did pretty well selling 250,000 units by 1999 with an additional 54,447 units sold in 2001. Freddy's success was quite a significant one for the company. While Putt Putt succeeded in establishing Humongous' presence in the market and getting them off the ground, Freddy Fish is credited as the one that put their name on the map. At the time, there were very few PC CD-ROM games one could find that had that quality animation and detailed backgrounds. It was even featured on an episode of the PBS show, The Computer Chronicles, and was bundled as a bonus with the kid's accessory, the Microsoft Easy Ball. Two years later, Freddy and Luther would get their next mystery to solve with the case of the haunted schoolhouse. On the day their school is having show and tell, Freddy and Luther quickly find out that a ghost is haunting the school, and is also stealing their schoolmates' toys. So they give chase in order to get them all back. However, they quickly discover that the ghost is a phony, so they decide to set up a trap to capture him. But they first need to go across the town and collect all the items needed to complete it, while of course helping out others along the way. It's about as much of a Scooby-Doo mystery as this series is gonna get. If there's one word to describe this game as it is compared to the first one, it'd be crystallized. The team did an amazing job improving nearly every aspect from the first game. The setup and conflict, though a bit sillier this time around, has more reasonable stakes and it also feels much more complete, as it does have Freddy and Luther interacting with the sharks a bit more and both sides do get what they want in the end. The game also does a great job at further building Freddy Fish's world, 
bringing in new locations and introducing new colorful and fun characters into the mix, as well as bringing back some from the last one. This is also where they firmly established the purple sea urchins as a form of currency, as opposed to being used as just ballast like in the first game. It's also packed with plenty of musical numbers that only last for a brief time whenever the player clicks on an instrument, but they're fun to listen to. I've had my breakfast. For the gameplay, it too has been greatly improved, as now the player only collects the items necessary for a specific path, apart from the sea urchins, and make sure not to leave any unused. Speaking of the paths, it has 8 game paths in total, while the first one only had 7. They also greatly scale back with the on-screen arrows, as now they only tell the player where each of the main locations are at. The mystery in this one, while again very Scooby-Doo-esque, is much more structured and connects better than the first ones did. Sure, it's obvious who the ghost is, but it still does a good job at keeping the player engaged, and the Rube Goldberg trap at the end is pretty cool to watch. The animation is much smoother and more fluid, and the character designs received a much needed refinement and polish. Also, the puzzles this time around were a bit more challenging and required a bit more creative thinking. The minigames in this, Crab Invaders, Drawing on the Chalkboard, and the Slide Puzzle are very enjoyable, and the latter is necessary in order to get one of the items, though fortunately, the player doesn't have to solve the whole thing in order to get it. Now, I'd be amiss if I didn't talk about this moment here. Well, so it is. <laughs> you boys will be wanting the accommodation to the trophy case. Excuse me, sir, but I'm not a boy. I'm a girl. There's actually a good reason for this bit being here. Not long after the first game's release, some people were confused as to whether Freddy was a boy or a girl, which is understandable since she doesn't have any distinctive feminine characteristics like long eyelashes. Tammy Borowick slipped that line in to set the record straight. This was also further cemented in Freddy Fish 5. Coincidentally, like with Putt-Putt, this game marks the only time a human is ever present in a Freddy Fish game. Granted, it's just voice only, but still. I could have sworn I felt a nibble. When class was in session on September 10th, 1996, it received a very warm reception. Critics gave it much more positive reviews than the first one, stating that the mystery plot was very involving while surprising the animation, characters, and musical numbers, and stated that it works as a very fitting sequel. So, with all of this, it should come as no surprise that it was easily a big sales winner. Fast forward another two years, and Freddy and Luther would get their next big case in the case of the stolen conch shell. In here, Freddy and Luther are on vacation and are invited to the Founders Day Festival on behalf of Luther's Uncle Blenny. When they arrive, however, they find out Uncle Blenny's been put in the slammer. Why? For the great conch shell was stolen. The Founders Day Festival can't start without it! Since I'm the grand exalted keeper of the conch, I'm the prime suspect! But I didn't do it! So now, they have to go across the area, gather up the clues, and locate the three golden pipes in order to find the real conch shell thief and prove Uncle Buddy's innocence. It's another solid entry in the series, as the mystery this time is more of a typical whodunit with multiple suspects and why and how they did it, which works perfectly for Freddy Fish as it allows for plenty of various gameplays. Speaking of which, with the number of locations the Golden Pipes are in on any given path, there are a grand total of 8 different paths creating 18 different possible gameplays. Once more, the game has the player going across the town gathering up what they need in order to get the Golden Pipes, and the locations are some of the most creative ones the series has had so far as well as the most vibrant and colorful. Also, it's always great to see more world building being done. The puzzles here up the challenge more than the first two, as some are multi-part and have varying levels of difficulty. Towards the end, there's one section where the player only has to play as Freddy herself. The mystery itself was much less predictable, as they've retired the sharks and the squid father in favor of having multiple outcomes, 
which does a great job at keeping the players on their toes, as they'll never know who the thief will be each time it's played. The minigames are very fun and enjoyable, despite being on the simple side, and two of which you have to play in order to get one of the golden pipes. The new characters introduced here are some of the most lively, charming, and colorful bunch in the series, though a couple of them do play into some stereotypes. I am Pierre the Taylor. When Pierre men sing, they are better than new. The animation is the most fluid and best looking it's ever been, and the animators did an amazing job with it, as well as adding little details, from the background bubbles and water ripples, to more subtle bits like the red glow coming out of the volcano, the tunnel's eyes moving, the lights flashing, and the flow of the waterfalls. One note I'd like to add is, the idea of having multiple endings was thought up by Mark Pacer during the making of Freddy Fish 2. While they couldn't do for that game as it was too far into production, they were able to with this one, as they built it in right from the beginning. When the fish held their celebration on March 31st, 1998, to no one's surprise, it was another bestseller, and the critics were giving it some good reviews for its plot and mystery, animation, gameplay, and for just being entertaining. The next year would see Freddy and Luther heading out west for their next adventure, The Case of the Hawkfish Rustlers of Briny Gulch. In this one, Freddy and Luther are on a trip to Freddy's cousin's ranch to be taught how to raise hawkfish, but upon arrival, they soon discovered that all of Cousin Calico's hogfish had been rustled by some hogfish rustlers, who were being held up in their hideout, the Rusty Rustler. Thus, they had to get together a rustler disguise so they can get in and rescue the hogfish. Now, before I go on, let me just say, if you're not a fan of westerns or western settings, then it'll affect your enjoyment of this game. Now, with all that said, Going from a tropical environment to a western one was an interesting choice, and it was good seeing them do a twist on the old cattle or sheep rustling storyline. But even with that going for it, this is one of the series' weaker entries. Don't get me wrong, it's far from a terrible game, but it somewhat feels like a step down from the last one. The stakes here are much more personal given that Calico raised and cared for all the hogfish herself but it oddly feels a bit smaller. I mean, it's going from stealing a priceless conch shell to rustling some hogfish. That there is already a step down. It's also odd that only one hogfish, Gruntle, can talk. There are also fewer suspects in here, with only four out of the 13 characters mean having to be involved with the rustling. Speaking of which, the new cast of characters are a pretty mixed bag. There are some that are fun and charming, with one from the previous game returning, while the others are just one note and don't have any interesting personalities beyond their one shtick. The backgrounds and locations, while nice looking and do a great job in invoking the western setting and atmosphere, do make the game look a bit samey, since the main color palette is brown mixed in with a little green, blue, and purple. With all that said however, this is still a fun and enjoyable game. The mystery is more of a caper, all about rustling and why the rustlers did it. But as I said before, it changes just enough things up to make it a different take, and having Freddy and Luther needing to disguise themselves in order to get into the hideout is a fresh spin, since the other games always had them automatically going to the last place. Also, having the rustlers main motive for stealing being they want to be hogfish ranchers themselves instead of selling them off for a profit was a nice and surprising twist. The puzzles, though more on the simpler side, still require some creative decision making and problem solving skills. Not to mention, it does have a good amount of genuinely funny moments sprinkled in. The Nickelodeon, Oyster Ant Arcade, and Warner Poster don't add much to the mystery, but they do work as little side sections for the players, and the former and latter help further add to the western theming. Also, despite the smaller number of suspects, the way they set up the reveal of Mr. Big is pretty clever. Instead of saying who the culprits were right out of the gate, they instead planted little hints through the character's actions that one of them could possibly be behind it while also giving decent reasons why the others couldn't have been. 
Not a whole lot of unused elements this time around, but there are two interesting ones worth mentioning. One is a bit of dialogue between Freddy and Luther about tying up the rope around the shark, but it got cut due to it being impossible to get the rope on the starfish path. The other is an alternate music cue for when Nelson is making the belt buckle. It's also the only game to not have any character cameos from the other humongous titles. When the duo headed out west on March 16, 1999, it became another Blue Ribbon sales winner. In fact, it had sold an additional 65,106 copies in 2001 alone, and the critics were once again praising it for its animation, characters, story, gameplay, and for being more challenging compared to the previous titles. Two years later, the duo would receive what would be their final case with the case of the creature of Coral Cove. In here, Freddy and Luther are off to have some fun at Coral Cove Park, but quickly learn it's been closed due to some recent sightings of a huge sea monster, and the citizens are about to form a lynch mob! So, the duo decide to investigate the matter at hand, only to uncover that there's more to this particular mystery than they thought. Just to add up, there wasn't a whole lot of unused elements that were left out of the final game, apart from, oddly, one music cue from Puppa Joins the Parade. So, this'll just be a breakdown of the game in general. As the final entry in the series, it definitely went out on a good note. The mystery here is a good step up from the previous one. It's another caper, but this time, Freddy and Luther had to get to the bottom of why the sea monster's been scaring everyone away from the park, and find out the real truth behind the matter. It also makes great use of misdirection, where it tries to fool players into thinking it's just a guy in a monster suit, making it seem like another Scooby-Doo mystery, only to then reveal, through some hints and clues, that the sea monster is for real. The puzzles here are among the trickiest ones the series has done yet, due to having many multi-part ones that require plenty of memorizing, decision making, and creative thinking. The Typhoons and Mess All Mania are really fun minigames that do work in giving a fun break in the middle of the investigation. Also, like in 3, there's one section where the player plays as just one character, this time being Luther. Maybe moving those colors around will unlock the door in the room above. Then I can let Freddy in. The animation here received a bit of a boost. Sure, most of it is recycled from 3 and 4, but the new ones done for the cutscenes do look quite nice, and there is some camera work in point, like this painting shot as they're swimming through the town. Also, it was nice to see a couple of old characters make their return here. Speaking of which, the new characters here have some of the most fun personalities of all the games, and even subvert some common character tropes. An interesting touch added here is having only some of them appear on a specific game path. So, one won't see them all at once during a playthrough. When Freddy and Luther journeyed out to Coral Cove on June 19, 2001, it was once again well received by critics, and it was easily another sales success, selling 119,739 units in North America. Following afterwards, there wouldn't be another new game developed, due to Day and Gilbert's resignations, the company reeling from the dot-com bubble burst, and their priorities switching over to the Backyard Sports series. Interestingly, had the Junior Adventure games continued on, they would have all made the switch over to full CGI, like the Backyard Sports games did. Though how they would have looked is another story. On another interesting note, Freddy Fish is the only series to have consistent voices for its two main characters, with Freddy herself being voiced by Annette Tatangi, and Luther voiced by Mike McGollif. The other games had to recast their leads for various outside reasons. Funny how that worked out in the end, huh? There were a couple of attempts to revive the series in the late aughts, with Freddy Fish, ABC Under the Sea for the Nintendo DS, and porting over the first game to the Wii. But both ended up being failures in more ways than one. On the plus side though, the series would be re-released on other platforms throughout the rest of the decade, before eventually being released on Steam, Android, and the App Store. Throughout its run, 
Freddy Fish will win numerous awards, including Best Children's Game, an All-Star Software Award, some awards of excellence, and even Family Life's Critics' Choice Award. Freddy Fish may seem like just another young kid's game series, but it's more than that. With charming and lovable characters, gameplay with some creative problem solving, imaginative scenarios, and has a lot of charm and funny moments that even adults find enjoy. Next time, we move from ocean mysteries to conquering fears for the next series, as we'll explore the creative worlds of a young superhero's imagination. Under the water is the place